Bonjour and welcome to the Total Sucker Show. My name is Daryl Grove and I'm joined by a man who non parle français. His name is Taylor Rockwell. Hello. What? No, I don't. Exactly. <laughs> spoiler alert, I don't either. Uh, spoiler alert, I am previewing France. That's the best French you're going to hear all day right there from Daryl Grove. Well done, my friend. We uh, So this is our first mm-hmm. Women's World Cup preview 2019, hosted by France. We are here to preview Group A. That we are. If you're wondering, Group A is France, you South Korea, also correct. Norway, In there. Nigeria. Also correct. Um, quick just a note at the top of the show. If you don't know, Women's World Cup starts June 7th. It does. There are six groups. There are. There are four teams in each group. Just confirming everything you're saying. The top two go through, and the, th- the four best third place teams go through. It's everyone's favorite format. It kind of isn't, right? No, it's but not. But it's at okay. All. Yeah. I actually think it works, though, especially when you look at Group A, mm-hmm. where I would argue France and Norway are the favorites, but then South Korea and Nigeria are the type of team that's always. Please let us get out of the group stage. Yeah, exactly. So you get like some third place teams going through, maybe some teams that have never made it make it out, maybe some teams yeah. that just barely finished third end up kind of making it to the knockout round, and then they go all the way and win it. Probably yeah. not, but maybe. <laughs> and top of the show is just mm-hmm. worth saying, obviously we are not women's soccer experts. We nope. know a little bit, mm-hmm. but we have done our research for these Women's World yes. Cup previews. So what you'll be hearing in this show um, is sort of a brief overview of how the team plays when you listen to the show. Um, and at least two, we've said two key players each, but knowing you and I, we'll probably end up mentioning more than two players Never. Each. <laughs> Never. Yeah, probably. That sounded about right. Uh-huh. Okay, so are you ready to get us started? Tom? I am. So once again, Group A is France, South Korea, Norway, Nigeria. We're going to go back and forth. Mm-hmm. And look of the draw, Taylor got the host, France. Please tell us all about France, Taylor. I believe I requested them. And that's how this <laughs> went down. Yes, uh, because I've got France, uh, nicknamed Le Bleu. Uh, and I'm going to say their nickname should be Le Bleu. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mostly because it's a great nickname, but also because it fits. Because I want to go back to prior to the 2018 World Cup, the men's side of the World Cup. Uh, If you discuss that France team, here's the description for you that I would go with. Uh, Managed by a former national team player with experience managing in the French Domestic League. Mm -hmm. Uh, They are absolutely loaded with talent. uh, Best players in the world, plus some up-and-coming stars. But they did leave some talent at home, like their league's top goal scorer. Because it wasn't a good fit, they wanted kind of chemistry in the players that fit the system. Uh, Questions about how best to put it all together and get the best out of everyone involved, haven't made it nearly as far as they probably should have in recent tournaments, lots of pressure to meet the potential this time around. That is the French national team proud of the 2018 World Cup. That is the French national team for the Women's World Cup in 2019 as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. And there really are lots of parallels between those two because this is the team that I think, especially given that they're hosting at a home soil, there's like references to 1998 in there as well, but it does feel like this team is expected to win it yeah. uh, or at the very least contested in the final. So before we get into the details, Mm-hmm. Of it. I mean, my take from a distance, because I haven't done the France research yeah. and you have, is that the French team has essentially been building in power year on year on year yep. on year. And it almost feels like this is the exact right time for this France team to be hosting the World Cup in yes. terms of we could win this at home. Yes, yeah? I, w- I would say so. I would also add that that's um, g- going to be one of the few times I compare a-, a women's team to a men's team. I know that's not always a popular thing to right. do, uh, but uh, for the purposes of comparing these two French teams, I think it fits pretty well. It also, I-, I think we talked about this mm-hmm. off air. If this French team wins on home soil, yeah. if it wins the World Cup, France will be the first nation to ever hold yep. the men's and women's World Cups simultaneously. You are right? correct. I mean, yes. it could all go wrong. It but could all go wrong. Right now, they look like, if you were a betting person, this would be maybe where you would put your money. I would say so. Also, I, gambling's wanna... illegal in most of the United States. Also worth that. Noting. Uh, yes, but I, I, I would agree with that. And I think maybe part of that, though, is still my lingering concerns about the U.S. women's national team mm-hmm. from that defeat to France. I would where say they as looked well, pretty well beaten. Just a little bit I've read mm-hmm. about France makes me worried about the U.S. Like, mm-hmm. it sort of always looks like, oh, the U.S. is good at this, or they have this great player. But then you see France's equivalent in that position, you're sort of like, oh, she might be better. Interesting that you should yeah. mention that, because in terms of how they play, I have it as pretty similar to the U.S. women's national team. Okay. Strong defenders, technical midfielders, fast, creative, wide attackers, uh, talented and proven goal scorers up front. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and really what that gets to is that they can attack in a variety of different ways, as can most teams that are pretty good. But I would say for France, their their big ones are uh, attacking down the channels, looking to like draw... Def- wide? Yes, and then looking to draw defenses out with a little bit of overload, and yeah. then you can kind of play through into the middle where you've got gaps and space and time to shoot. So, okay, let's, I want to ask you, sure. who, who are they doing that through then? Say so when they go out to the channels, mm-hmm. who are these wide players that people need to be keeping 
keeping an eye out because I think sure. part of these previews should mm-hmm. be if people aren't familiar or even if they are maybe I want people to come away from these previews with names to watch when mm-hmm. they see France in the opening game so I mean grain of salt because we never know exactly who the starting yeah, 11 yeah, is yeah. going to be um, but the two if if France come out on their kind of preferred 4-2-3-1 and it's the personnel I think it will be uh, on the right I think it will be uh, Delphine Cascarino who mm-hmm. we'll hear more about later on the left uh, Kadi Diatu uh, Gianni uh, I think those are going to be the kind of wide attackers but the other one that you should maybe focus on as well is Amel Majri who's the left back for France also Ooh, for Lyon okay who, when we, when you ask us to focus on the left back that yeah. always means this means like Marcelo territory right it means a little something bit. special yes yeah. because what I kept seeing was uh, Amanda, Amandine Henri who's their captain and central midfielder yeah she would move we out we talk more about her later because I've seen footage of her and yeah. I'm terrified of her as well you yeah. should be uh, she drifts out into the channels sometimes uh, Gaetan Tine I think is how you pronounce it uh, she is their kind of number 10 she'll move out wide as well so suddenly you'll have like on that left side you might have uh, say Gianni Majri and Tine like all move over on, and then you've got this kind of triangle of very talented technical players who can pass around you and so you the logical inclination if you're the defense is to pull people over to deal with that yeah. but that leaves players unmarked in the middle okay so remind me some names again mm-hmm. who is the left back that we need to keep an eye on uh, Amel Majri Amel Majri M-A-J-R-I okay. got it uh, and then you've got uh, Kadi Diatu Gianni D-I-A-N-I uh, oh. that's the left winger and then Delphine Cascarino is the right winger oh okay mm-hmm. uh, what else is there to say about France because you also as I said they have a, a variety of attack if they're sitting back if they're kind of absorbing pressure Wendy Renard who is their uh, former captain no longer the captain but I'm familiar still, with Wendy Renard yeah uh, still their starting center back uh, can score some goals but can play some long balls and uh-huh. that's another way that they can kind of go right at you is they can invite that pressure if a team is kind of going at France Wendy Renard can unleash that like 60 yard ball over the top into the channels or just over the top for Eugenie Le Somme is my That's a name attempt I know. at pronunciation. I think of Le Somme as the essentially the the French goal scorer. Yes. Is that correct? She moves around a little bit. Sometimes it's Gianni uh, up top uh, starting as the forward and sometimes it's Le Somme out wide. But that's when they're kind of deliberately tinkering because there were moments uh, in the lead up to this World Cup in the last like, year or so where they've gone with a back three and then yeah. sometimes they do different things. But for the most part, it's Le Somme out top. Yes. Here's a good way to remember it. Sommeliers mm-hmm. serve up wine. Uh-huh. Le Somme serves up goals. There we go. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> oh, Wendy Renard. I don't mm-hmm. think she, we're going to do key players, right? Is she mm-hmm. one of your key players? She is not. So I think she's worth focusing on. Mm-hmm. Six foot one yep. is what I know about Wendy Renard. An absolute like weapon on set pieces mm-hmm. defensively and offensively, yep. as we say here in the United States. I mean, and another key part of Wendy Renard is her uh, partnership with Grige Mbach. Let me guess, they both play for Lyon. They do. Seven <laughs> players on this team. Uh, seven players in the starting 11 play for Lyon. Champions League winners, right, Lyon? Uh, four times in a row, yes. Ooh. And have won 13 straight uh, league titles in France, I believe, as well, for Lyon have. So yeah, decent, uh, decent competitive record there. So that has to be a huge advantage for France, yes. right? If you've got a national team and the, like a core plays for this really successful mm-hmm. club team, and that the centre-backs play together and everybody's really familiar, that's good news if you're a national team. I'll take you through it right now, because yes, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> oh, was this already in your preview? Yes. I'm uh, sorry. I'm Sarah sorry. Buhati, the goalkeeper, yep. plays for Lyon. Your two centre-backs, Renard and uh, Grigion Bach, both uh, play for Lyon. Majri, the left back that I mentioned previously uh-huh. uh, as well. Amadine Henri, so, ahead of them. So uh, that's everybody except the right back. Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> so yes, you got four of the of the back five there. Yeah. Henri ahead, uh, Delphine Cascarino on the right wing uh-huh. does as well as does uh, Eugene Le Sommer. So yes, it's a it's a decent number of attackers and defenders all playing together consistently for one of the best teams in Europe, if not the best team in Europe. Okay, so we haven't done the previews there, mm-hmm. but maybe we should cancel this and just give the World Cup to France. I mean, there's some other teams in there who might disagree. Are there any weaknesses? Is there anything that like France need to be worried about? Uh, I mean, yes. I mean, it, it is a French team that again historically have not like performed to the level that like would be expected I think okay. in their most recent tournaments they haven't made it like into the final eight I think or they, mm-hmm. they tend to get knocked out uh, more early than they should and for every game like they had against the United States where they win three to one they have games like when they lose four nil to Germany so there are definitely vulnerabilities that can be exploited they do rely on like like I think if Wendy Renard happens to get hurt there mm-hmm. are some problems there they do have a young a uh, young center back uh, Alisatu Tunkara plays for Atletico, Atletico Madrid I believe it is who could could maybe deputize, but again, you don't have that level of experience. Um, and then I would say, not necessarily a vulnerability at all, but their uh, their coach is also one to uh, to keep an eye on, just because I think she has a very fascinating background. What's her name? Uh, you said she used to play for the national team, right? Cor- yep, uh, Corinne uh, Diacre. 
D I A C R E. I don't know. It's got a question mark on the end. It does. It's weird. Forty four <laughs> years old, former national defender, one hundred and twenty one appearances. But uh, as the Guardian uh, profile of the team pointed out, uh, she was the first woman uh, to coach a men's side in France. Three seasons in League Two, uh, Ligue 2, with uh, Clermont Foot, and it might have been the first woman to ever coach in like the top flight. I could be wrong huh. on that one. Um, but then she took over this French team that tends to underperform. It does feel like she's kind of whipped them into a much more competitive animal, and I would you, expect you them to go top, pretty far. You mentioned at the top that she left certain players out just to fit the system, yes, right? I'm not, uh, I'm not necessarily asking you to name those Marie players. Antoinette Catoto, 20-year-old forward, uh, the top scorer in the league, 22 goals for PSG, as well as Clarisse Le Bihan, uh, 24-year-old forward for Montpellier, 13 goals, 6 assists this season. So, so like, excuse me, but Marie Antoinette was beheaded for the for the good of the people. Exactly, exactly. There you go. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's basically, I think they don't necessarily fit exactly what they want to do, mm-hmm. so she'd rather bring in players who are more familiar, who are maybe more likely or more veterans yeah. to kind of perform in that moment. Are you ready to talk key players? I suppose I am. So our, our deal was basically we do two key players <laughs> yes. each, right? So where, where do you want to start? Uh, I will go with Amandine Henri. Okay. Uh, we, I mentioned her already, 29-year-old captain, 83 appearances, 11 goals. Goals not necessarily what you should be looking for, although she will happily shoot from distance if so. I, she has a thunderbolt of a foot from mm-hmm. the highlights I've seen. Yes. Yeah. But I think the thing that stands out to me, yes, she has a thunderbolt, but it's, it's mostly just like her calmness. Which I guess is the calmness in the storm instead of the, th- <laughs> the thunderbolt. But it's, it's mostly just that... Pat O'Mara, just turn this off. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, you probably did. Or, or tweeted about it somehow, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but it, it's just like, I mean, certainly every player is going to have some bad passes, some bad shots. But for the most part, what's, what stands out to me about Henri is that she makes just smart, simple decisions, mm-hmm. which is you want from a player playing in that sort of holding midfield role, where... We'll play one touch. We'll kind of turn under pressure and alleviate some of that pressure if maybe teams are trying to go with a high press. She can play her way out of it, but she can also play simple. She does a lot of that sort of like when everybody's kind of frenetically moving around the top of the box, you'll just see her like get the ball from one side, kind of turn and just spread it out to the other and just yeah. very calm, very poised on the ball and she never looks the particularly hassled. And that's what you want yeah. from your captain who sees the matrix. Yes. <laughs> I also, or, or Le Matrix, mm-hmm. um, I, the highlights I saw of Amandine Henry, mm-hmm. she didn't look fast. But she looked like she would go past people, like just using sort of the strength of her hips. Mm-hmm. She would almost nudge people out of the way and go past them, which is a yeah. thing you d- I don't see often in soccer. No, I mean, it's, it's a thing. I think the times that you do see it, like at even at amateur level, is when it's a person who's maybe older, a bit craftier, a bit yeah, more of a veteran, savvy, right? going up against younger players where there is that little bit of like, no, you can use your hips to knock a player uh-huh. off the ball. That's totally legal. You can use your shoulder to knock a player off. Like yeah. that's shoulder to shoulder. That's what it's called. Uh, and yes, she does do... Like, not a lot of that, but she definitely knows how to use her body. She's not necessarily one who I think of as, like, flying into challenges. She'll make good uh, good tackles. Yeah, she, yeah. she embarrassed Abby Dahlkemper uh, when, when facing the United States. But for every one of those tackles, I feel like she it's much more right positioning, calm on the ball, helps, helps with ball recoveries because she tends to find herself in the right spot. And at a certain point, when you keep doing that, it becomes less of like, oh, she just happens to be in the right spot all the time yeah, and more yeah. of a, oh, she puts herself in the right spot all so the time. I'm already looking forward to if the US mm-hmm. plays France I'm sorry I keep putting this through the US lens but it's the team we know the best and mm-hmm. it's probably the team most of our listeners will know the best Yep, some sort of Juliet versus Amandine Henri mm-hmm. 50-50 ball yeah I want to see how that ends up I would back Julia Ertz to win the header, but I, that's because I yeah. feel like. I, I, but I would back Amandine Henri to like fake going for that header and then back off ten yards and like collect the fifty fifty yeah. ball that spills loose. And it could be like an Ertz slide tackle mm-hmm. versus uh, Amandine Henri's like yeah. hip strength. Yeah, like there could I be mean, some weird uh, result of that. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, like I do think that there's lots. You don't need of to declare a winner. No, it's it's just more so that like those are the, maybe the that's the one that like I think of Julie Ertz as being a bit more physical and like emotional from what I've heard in terms of like she like I think Julie Foudy said that when she was on the ground that like yeah she can be a little bit emotional. No, that was Abby Wambach said that about her that like she can get get really amped and up for stuff and she's yeah. like try to yell and scream and that emotionally not, a good way right and lift yeah. your teammates let's go get them kind of way. Yeah, but yeah. I'm just saying that like that seems to be the difference with Henri is that it, oh. it seems like it's a bit more of just a like steely like this is how you lead. Yeah. That difference aside, I feel. Like like there are many, many, many similarities between these two uh, teams, as I said. So if she's cool, then in more ways than one, she's a hipster. Yes, exactly. I see what you've done there. Well played, sir. Uh, I'm going to move swiftly away from that into the other player I wanted to talk about. I mentioned her previously, uh, Delphine Cascarino. Okay. Uh, she's a a young Travis, and I talked about her in our like young players to watch. Uh, wide, like right winger is where I think she'll be. Occasionally, she pops up as a center forward, but mostly on the right. And as I okay. said, when Travis and I talked about her on the Top Draw Soccer Show, she reminds me of of like a French Tobin Heath. Again, there's lots of parallels here because she is. 
Maybe maybe a little bit faster than Tobin Heath. I genuinely don't know how fast I would, she is. I'd sign off on that having okay. watched some highlights. I think I refer to her as Tobin Heath with acceleration. There we go. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because she's got the acceleration, but she's also got the foot skills to go with that. Because so often we see players who are, uh, on both the men's and women's side, like players who are very fast, but maybe as a result, they knock the ball forward a little bit too far, don't have quite the control. She's one of those rare players who can go like with pace but keep the ball and then still pull off a move at the end of it, that she yep. can stop suddenly and, and do a double step over but use it successfully as opposed to just kind of throwing on a move to see what happens. I think of her, um, I know we said we wouldn't compare to member mm-hmm. often, but I think of her as maybe Kylian Mbappe-esque in that she dangles her pace in front of a defender mm-hmm. like a threat. Yep. Like, you know it's coming. You know it's coming. You know I'm going to accelerate past you. You just don't know when it's going to be or which direction I'm going to go in. And here's maybe a step over to throw you off as well. And you can see the defenders then just start, start to panic. I would agree. Uh, I mean, with, if it was killing Mbappe as a right winger, I would 100% agree. Because yeah. <laughs> that's, yes, especially because... We don't know his politics. Frequently we do not, but possibly. Uh, <laughs> it, it, like, frequently what I saw, is, to your point, is defenders, I think, aware of that sort of pace and sort of standing off a little bit and almost inviting that like okay you're going to touch it towards the end line then you're going to kind of square it so I'm going to try to ca- oh you cut past me and that's yeah. like what I kept seeing is like players trying to give that ch- like okay I'll give you the wide side you can dribble to the end line but I'm not going to let you get by me but because they're kind of preparing for that I saw Cascarino on multiple occasions just cut back and then still either find a pass or find a cross from inside the box but not from the end line and so and then occasionally gets a shot off as well she can score goals too so I, I think she is going she to be a great name for goal scoring as well if she scores, uh-huh. yeah, I can imagine a commentator being like, Cascarino! Mm-hmm. You know and, and has a twin sister who did not make the squad oh. uh, and is not related to Tony Cascarino, as her Wikipedia page will tell you. No. Oh, well, Tony Cascarino was <laughs> adopted, so maybe. Oh, there you go. All right. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think Wikipedia, again, says no. But Daryl says maybe. <laughs> Daryl says maybe. So Amandine Henry, mm-hmm. defensive midfielder. Delphine Cascarino, mm-hmm. right winger, very probably, yeah. uh, players to watch. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to let people know about this France team before, um, we, before we I, move on? I did not mention Elise Busalia, who's the other central midfielder alongside Amandine Henri in that 4-2-3-1. They have a long-standing partnership. They do not play together at club level. Uh, I forget, but Busalia might be with... She's either with like Montpellier, Dijon, or Paris S- FC, or mm-hmm. uh, PSG. Those mm-hmm. are like the other teams in the, the French money League. Teams, That's pretty much it, yes. Yeah, yeah. yes. Oh, yeah, uh, I, want to, I want to ask you about the French League. Because mm-hmm. um, I think like looking at... A, uh, uh, women's domestic league is a, a something of an indicator of the strength of women's soccer in that country. Mm-hmm. Um, so what's going on? Uh, what's it called and what's going on with the uh, women's French league, French women's league? I, I think it's, I, I keep referring to this as French women's league. I think it's the feminine, feminine um, I okay. think is the league. Uh, it's created in 1974. Uh, the current in- incarnation has 12 clubs. There's promotion relegation. I think bottom, bottom two are relegated to uh, feminine two or feminine do or however mm-hmm. you would do that in French. Again, I don't speak it. Um, and I would say... It's like you've like, never seen Hot Shot sequel. I, I, I have not. I mean, not since I was 10, 9? Uh-huh. I don't know when that came out. But yeah, I watched it when I was way too young. Uh, That's a recurring theme with me in watching movies when I was young. <laughs> I saw Terminator 2 in theaters. Come to find out it was only in theaters when I was 9. So that's parenting. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, yes, the, the, the French League is, is slightly confusing to me because it definitely feels like a haves and have-nots sort of situation to the extent that I believe I'm correct in saying that it's a mixture of professional teams and some amateur teams or at least in the top couple, like the top two flights. Yeah. So that kind of gives you an, incl- like an indication as to why Lyon have been so successful because I think their owner has put money into the team. I think he wants to have the best women's team possible, and he puts money into it and routinely does. Here's my guess. Mm-hmm. Leon have been dominant for a while, as you yep. said. Did you say 13 league titles in a row? Uh, yes. Um, I would bet PSG are starting to catch up. I, I wouldn't be surprised if PSG have said, okay, let's compete and we'll put some money into this team. I mean, I think they are. They, they've definitely had, uh, like, they definitely have their fair share of players, not yeah. quite at the level of Lyon. I think they won the, like, the Coupe de France uh, uh-huh. last season. That said, aside from not winning it in 2018, Lyon have won it. I think six of the last seven times possible. So again, it's a very dominant Leon side. And it, it really, it feels like a, a team that just decided, their owner decided, we're putting money into this. We want to build this very strong team. They have, again, seven of 11 possible starters for the French national team. Mm. They've got the reigning Ballon d'Or winner. We'll talk about her when we get to Norway. She starts up top for them. It's a very, very strong team, which I think helps overall because, yeah, it raises the level of kind of competition for other clubs who want to be able to compete. Yeah, so you set the, set the bar, maybe exactly. other teams try to reach it which I guess, it. Is good. I guess is good for French football overall I'm sure some people would argue with me I mean I think it's good in the sense that those few clubs that I mentioned those like four or five teams that are, are taking it more seriously than maybe the others uh, from what I understand are paying uh, pretty well to very well 
like especially when it comes to like women's soccer in general, that I think you've got players making a very good wage. All right, so first game for France. I'm mm-hmm. assuming they open the tournament, They right? do. Because they're the hosts. June Who- 7th, France versus the... Uh, Republic of Korea <laughs> at nice. 3 p.m. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I learned not to say South Korea. I, I said well, this. I I've told this story with. before. It was the Korean consul general who kind of stared at me icily and said, it's the Republic of Korea. We are not South Korea. <laughs> like, oh, right. Right, 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 right. So that is your opening mm-hmm. game on June 7th. Yes. Our eyes will be on the TV watching. It certainly will. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, before we move on to uh, our next team, which is South Korea. Uh-huh. Excuse me, Republic of Korea. That was not a deliberate mistake. Um, today's show is sponsored by a new Total Soccer Show sponsor. Who's this new sponsor, Dale Grove? FBref.com. Mm-hmm. The letter F, the letter B, REF.com, stands for Football Reference. Come. Mm-hmm. So this is part of a suite of sites. I think they do like base, uh, ba- basketball. You almost said That's basketball, not, didn't you? Do, right? They don't do basketball. <laughs> they do psych stats. outs. <laughs> they do basketball, mm-hmm. baseball, like o- other sports. They are doing football and Grand soccer slams. stats. And they're going to have a special section for the Women's World Cup. Mm-hmm. And they already have a nice uh, collection of women's soccer stats or Woso stats, as yes. some people might say. Indeed. So, uh, and I appreciate it because you can kind of find find the team you might be researching or just wanting mm-hmm. to read about and sort of look at some of their players. You could look at the statistics and that does help you if you're not familiar with them as, say, maybe we weren't with uh, Nigeria uh-huh. or maybe Korea. Yeah. Uh, you can sort of look at, okay, this player's done this, this player's played in this many games, do they score this often? Okay, now I kind of want to take a further look at this player or this player. So here's what I did. I went and looked at Wendy Renard. Mm-hmm. So I was fascinated by her international goal scoring record because she yep. has 20 goals for the French national team she's a center back by the way so i looked at her season in uh league on with leon um she played 17 games she scored eight goals yeah mm-hmm. if she were a striker that would be a decent return mm-hmm. like maybe not the best ever striker season but you'd be like that's not bad right yeah, she's good it's almost almost she's a goal over the game a slight threat on set piece she's a center back yeah. and she scored eight goals in 17 games mm-hmm. i learned that at fbref.com yeah and 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 that's I guess that's the type of useful stat I'm I'm talking about because from there you can you can assume oh she's a center back she's going forward and winning set pieces and winning headers but if you then go watch Wendy Renard you'll see that no she can get forward and she does get forward yep. and will happily take a shot uh, if the situation allows her to and has is more than capable of scoring a goal mm-hmm. so like you can kind of again it's that jumping off point to get further information about that player to help yep. you further understand that player and it kind of made me think step it up Becky Sauerbrunn. <laughs> How dare you? How <laughs> dare you? She's busy putting out fires for true, the, uh, for the national team. Uh, hopefully not too many, but maybe some against France. We'll see. <laughs> you got any stats you want to share that you found at fbref.com? Uh, sure. I mean, it, we haven't talked about the players yet. I will say that uh, when it comes to your Norway preview, the two players that you are going to be talking about, uh, what I did appreciate is that you can see them. In Wait, a was state... I supposed to pre- preview Norway? Oh, excuse me, Nigeria. Excuse oh, me. Uh, the, and I they thought they'd bo- been a terrible mistake with our preview they system. They both start with an N. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, no, but I was looking at the players, and you could see not just like – total minutes played this season or in their whole career, but you can also look at individual tournaments. So I went back. Both of your Nigerian players, I won't spoil it, they both played in the oh, my key players. Pre- previous World Cup, mm-hmm. but one played 270 minutes. They only played three games. The other played 264 minutes. So <laughs> one of them working a little bit harder than the other. <laughs> All right, do you, uh, to, to finish this ad off. Um, Just saying, Anomi Ebi, slacking. I've got one little question for you. Mm-hmm. Um, I looked at David Beckham's career minutes. Uh-huh. How many minutes did David Beckham play in his entire career? I'm going to say several. I'm going to say several minutes, Daryl Grove. I have no idea. That, that, is, that is too much math for even my tiny brain to handle. It's in the tens of thousands. It's not above 100,000. Oh, okay. So See, I'm, going to, I'm going to narrow it for you a little bit if you want to take a guess. All right, let's see. So, like, mid-90s he starts. I'm, yeah. I'm going to say, like, I don't even remember when his last season was. But I'm going to, I'm going to give him... He's PSG, a, which is kind of why I was interested. I'm going to give him, like, a... F- uh, There's no money right on this. Just take a guess. Uh, 58,000 minutes. Not a bad guess. It was 41,245 minutes. Get it minutes together, Beckham. Does that include charity games that he played this weekend? Because it is worth <laughs> noting the Man United Bayern Munich game was 17,000 minutes long. <laughs> it did not. I'm not sure that was a uh, You should add that in there. Okay. Yeah. Well done then, Tyler. Right. <laughs> you competitive son of a gun. I believe it's still happening right now by that logic. But so, all right, whatever. <laughs> it's a long game, right? All those 50-year-old men are real tired. They get tired um, of cricket having the record for longest game. Yeah. <laughs> so once again, today's sponsor was fbref.com. 
fbref.com. Mm-hmm. If you go there, you can also sign up for their newsletters. The links will be in the show notes. But also, if you go to fbref.com in the uh, in the sort of navigation bar at the top, you'll see a link to sign up for a newsletter. There's a soccer newsletter, and just during the Women's World Cup, there's a special Women's World Cup newsletter. So you get all the stats delivered and game recaps and stuff like that delivered to your inbox uh, by via fbref. All right. So thank you to FBREF for sponsoring today's episode. We're happy to have them on board as a sponsor. Always happy to have new sponsors. And always happy to hear Daryl Grove preview some women's World Cup teams. Who have you got, Mr. Grove? I've got the Republic of Korea, Mm -hmm. whom some people call South Korea. Um, The nickname for the Republic of Korea is... Taiguk Nangja, which means the Taiguk ladies, Mm -hmm. because the South Korean men's team is the Taiguk Warriors. Yep. Right? The nickname should be the Golden Generation. Okay. This is the Golden Generation of uh, Korea Republic so, women's soccer. The nickname for this specific tournament, not just in ge- generally speaking. Yes, the nickname is not always yeah, going to be the Golden the Generation. For this 2019 right. team, should be the Golden Generation. Gotcha. So, uh, Korea Republic don't have a great, great history, right? They've only been to two World Cups before. Um, 2003, they didn't get out of the group. 2015, they got to the round of 16 with a load of these players, hmm. right? Um, I actually haven't got the numbers on exactly how many players carried over from 2015 to 2019, but I can tell you that all the way back in 2010, Korea Republic won the U-17 World Cup and finished third at the U-20 uh, World Cup. And there's 10 players, five from each each of those teams, are on this roster. So this really is the golden generation of uh, Korea Republic. I'm going to start saying South Korea. <laughs> Republic <laughs> just, of Korea. Just say South Korea. It's fine. Korea. I'm going to say Korea. Okay, yes. Yeah, because Kim Jong-un Korea is not there this time, right? Uh, so, and also, just maybe we just shouldn't ever talk about the Kim, Kim Jong-un uh, North Korea. Ever. There we go. Yeah. All right, yeah. so Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the golden generation. We can call it, okay, from now on, for the history of the Total Soccer Show, North Korea is DPRK. Just call them DPRK, DPRK okay. and then South Korea can be whatever career they want to be that Korea. isn't DPRK. Okay. Got it. Perfect. So they are coached by um, a guy called Yoon Dyuk Yu. Mm-hmm. He is like a former uh, men's uh, career player. Um, he always goes four at the back. Mm-hmm. I think he's going to go mostly 4-1-4-1 four, one, four, one in this tournament because that's what he tends to do when he's up against uh, tougher opposition which is what Korea are up against Mm -hmm. in this tournament, right? Even, like, Nigeria, I think, is tougher than a lot of the teams they usually face. And definitely France and Norway are tougher. So I think he's going to go with a 4-1-4-1. And not to put you on the spot, but, like, so do you think... But to actually put me on the spot. Well, just more so to say, like, if if you're not sure, that's fine. But, like, so do you expect them to kind of play a certain system, like, every single game? Or do you think it will be more like we're playing some stronger teams... We're going to be like defensive in bunker, but then maybe against stronger teams, we'll be a little bit more aggressive. I mean, I think everything's a stronger team, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that's why four one four one will be the way to go. Okay. And it'll maybe you could argue it's a four three three when they sort of open up and go forward a mm-hmm. bit. But yeah, I think four one four one is what they're going to do. Okay. Yeah. All right. Unless they somehow manage to play Thailand at some point, you know what I mean? So would that make the the one and the one the most important players that you're going to be talking about? Not exactly. Okay. One of the ones okay. is, but uh, one of the fours <laughs> okay. um, is what the Makes most important total sense. players. Um, that will make more sense. <laughs> yes. Mm. Um, so their style of play, yeah. um, from what I've seen, and I've, you know, I've watched, there are a few games on YouTube that I managed to watch. I would call them a short, 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 long team. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, coming out of the back, short passes into yeah. midfield, maybe a bit of pressure on the midfielder, back to the defense, they move it around a little bit, and then eventually they'll hit a channel or hit someone in behind. Do you know what I mean? So it's a lot of short passing yeah. with an eventual sort of direct ball out wide or in behind. Do you know why that makes me chuckle? No. Did you do that on purpose? No. Okay, because you know there's a drill called short, short, long. Yes. It's like, okay, okay. I didn't know I, you had, did, I did add an extra short. I didn't know if you just happened to do that or yeah. if that was like, a, yeah, because yeah. that's what made me laugh. It's like, it's a perfect explanation uh-huh. of what they're going to do. It's like, I'm going to be a little <laughs> bit more short passing, but then they're going to look long. And I, I want to make sure we're not speaking in soccer jargon that people don't understand. Mm-hmm. We're talking about like a short pass, a short pass, a short yep. pass, and then a long pass. Yep. And that is like, that's a drill people do because it's a good variation, right? Because yeah. it sort of it says to the team, "Hey, we're doing this one thing for a yep. bit, but hey, surprise! Yeah, comes so everybody comes step and pressure. Now you've stepped up. Now we can hit you over the top. There you go. Mm-hmm. Uh, the key. Oh, so before I get into key players, um, one of the things that worries me about Korea mm-hmm. is the defending. Okay, <laughs> every game I've seen against decent opposition, I've seen what I would call panicky defending. Mm-hmm. Panicky defending, and I'm talking about things like someone runs at the defense and all the defenders sort of drop and run backwards. I'm talking about um, center backs. Uh, should I name it? Yeah, Jung Young Ah, uh, mm-hmm. who'd be wearing number four. I've seen her pull Sam Kerr's shirt when she didn't need to <laughs> against ah. Australia, give away a penalty kick in the fourth minute. In the same game, I've seen her go charging out to win a ball that she was never going to win, and teams get in behind her. I've seen fullbacks defend wingers with their back to the winger. Mm-hmm. They got so turned around that they just had weird defensive position. Just a lot of defensive mistakes. That so, is not a great thing 
to know heading into their first game against France. Right. That's a team that you want to play maybe last if you can because yes. that feels like emotion taking over mm-hmm. rather than like individual team preparation. Yep. That in the moment it's like, oh, I just got to pull this player down. I don't want to get beat. I don't want to get posterized. Against France, they've got a number of players who can do that and they've also yeah. got a number of players who can hit that free kick. Cascarino coming at you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the shield that mm-hmm. guards the realms of Korean defenders. <laughs> Um, is one of my key players. Oh, boy. I didn't plan that, and it shows. Um, one of my key players is number eight. Does it show, though? Cho, Does it? Cho So Hyun, mm-hmm. the defensive midfielder. Okay. Cho So Hyun is the defensive midfielder. Um, she's one of the only three players that don't play in the domestic Korean league. She plays for West Ham. Mm-hmm. She'll be the captain. Cho will be the captain. And she's kind of a badass. Okay. <laughs> she loves to charge in, um, get like tight to an opponent who has the ball, and tangle for the ball. Yeah. She's like, get close and poke, poke, poke until I come away with the ball kind of player, which is weirdly effective, but is maybe not, it's not enough to um, guard the entire defense, right? Uh, no, it's definitely not. But it is a, like, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking about because I watched some of the clips of her as well, and it mm-hmm. felt like she's very good about, like, kind of, like, not necessarily, like, sneaking up on the player who has the ball, but it's like, yes. they'll get the ball, she'll kind of be behind them, and then suddenly she's, like, putting them under pressure, and it's usually, like, what seems like it should be a foul, but somehow she finds a way to like not kick the person with the ball, but like yeah. gets just a, a a toe to it or pokes to it, and somehow yes. she like She's turns with it, it at the same time. Yeah, yeah. it's it's weird. It's like a fish hook defense that she manages to pull that's off. A great, that's a great phrase for it. I don't quite know how she does it. <laughs> so that's why I said she's one of the important ones because mm-hmm. in the four one four one, she will very likely be the defensive midfielder. Unless I have seen sometimes the coach. I don't know if this is like centre back shortage or just like we need our best defensive mm-hmm. player playing centre back. Sometimes you'll see Cho at centre back, mm-hmm. which is a thing maybe he could pull out, maybe against France or something. If he's if he's worried, she, a and she's bit. your veteran player and she's your captain. I guess that makes yes. sense that you you'd put her back there. Yeah. My my concern about her and the player that you're going to mention is that both of them. I did not know what you were going to say about them and some of the weaknesses in this Korea team, and I saw those a number of times in both of these players playing at club level. So the idea of like them maybe pulling people back or fouling people when they don't need to and just like trying a little bit too hard to win the ball. You talk about Cho? Yeah, both yeah. both Cho and the other player that you're going to talk about oh, who you Jisoo haven't yet talked about. But yeah, that that is a now that you've mentioned it, a disconcerting reality mm-hmm. of like they're maybe not going to try to win the ball in the air, but they are going to like hassle you for the ball that could yes. lead to lots of fouls. Yeah, so look out for. Cho so here number eight. Mm-hmm. She will play ugly. She will win a lot of ball doing that. Mm-hmm. She might give away a few free kicks. Although she's kind of, she does toe the line kind of nice. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, I think so. Yeah. I think her, her more so than uh, Ji So Yun. Is that how yes. you pronounce that one? So my second key player is Ji So Yun. She will wear number 10. Uh, she plays for Chelsea mm-hmm. in the FA Women's uh, Super League. She is the player for Korea. Okay. In a way that's kind of like she might be just too good for her teammates. I've seen so much footage of Ji So Yun dribbling at people, changing direction really quickly, um, fooling defenders, drawing people in, and then laying off a perfectly weighted pass, and then a teammate misses. Mm-hmm. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, I, I do. It's almost like she belongs on a better team. Well, that, it's interesting you say that because I, I, I saw her playing for Chelsea, yeah. and I saw a lot of. Similar stuff to what I was talking about with Amadine Henri, where there was a lot of like one touch passes under pressure, where she would sort of like, like, had, like if, if it was Daryl facing me, like playing the ball to me, and it was like a sort of like diagonal pass with the right side of the foot, like into space to a player on her team, yeah. that like she would do like a one touch to kind of alleviate pressure and very simple passing. I did not see nearly as much of that when she was playing with Korea, and I do now wonder if that's because maybe her teammates aren't expecting a one-touch pass to come out of nowhere into space, <laughs> and so she instead kind of holds the ball up a little bit more. I will say, watching all these all this footage and highlights of uh, Ji So Yun, again, mm-hmm. she'll wear number 10, I'm kind of excited to watch her play, because yeah. I, I think I've talked about this before, I'm a sucker for a brilliant player on a not brilliant team because there's so much goes through that person and you're just going to see them on the ball so much. I honestly think she's kind of a magician, by which I mean magic is not real and it's all about misdirection because mm-hmm. <laughs> she does do a lot of misdirection, as in like like just lean one way, go the other way, or lean one way and play a weird disguised pass the other way. So there's going to be a lot of like really exciting moments from Ji Yun. I mean, breaking news that magic isn't real, but okay. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise I'm with you. All right. Um, so, but my, my question then is like, like, from what I saw of of these two players and a few like highlights from Korea, 
it did not seem like they were particularly good in the air. Am mm. I wrong in saying that, or did you see? I mean, that they don't as have well? Wendy Renard. Yeah, I mean, there's that. Maybe that's what it is. Is I'm just biased from watching France play. Yeah, but yeah. like my note for uh, Jisoo Yeon was that she didn't seem particularly physically imposing in the air. That they'll yeah, do she's a lot. Five foot three. Yeah, that, I guess that's what I mean. Is like, yeah. but I feel like you want the, some of those midfielders to be a little bit more like you know they're going to win at least some of those 50-50 aerial challenges, yeah. and I didn't see a lot of that. I saw them sort of no, battling I mean, to the ball on the floor. I wouldn't say that was one of Korea's strengths. Okay. Let's, let's put it that okay. way. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, so yeah, keep an eye on Ji Tso Hyun, number mm-hmm. 10. Keep an eye on Cho Soo Hyun, mm-hmm. uh, number 8. In terms of where the goals are coming from, um, I'm not going to go into detail on these players, but it's just worth knowing. Um, Son Hua Yun, uh, she's 22 years old. She went number 22. She scored 7 in 20 for Korea. So not amazing. Mm-hmm. Actually not as good as Wendy Renard's league on numbers. <laughs> but... <laughs> But she might be the player um, who will be on the on the end of things um, when Jisoo Yun plays some of those clever, clever uh, through balls. All right. Final thing to watch. I'm gonna. We're not gonna do this regularly, but a specific prediction. Oh. Jisoo Yun will score a free kick. Okay. I've seen her step up and bend all kinds of free kicks in. So watch out for Jisoo Yun bending in some free kicks. Okay. Yeah. I, I like this plan. I like this specific prediction. And I have a specific prediction of my own for Norway, who Do are the you? next team we're going to be talking about. Anything oh, else from... Just uh, fine, yeah. yeah, final thing is just about the uh, Korean women's game. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's the WK League. Um, started in 2009. Has eight teams... One of those teams is Incheon Hyundai Steel Red Angels, who have won the last six league championships. Mm-hmm. They're a little bit like the Leon of Korea mm-hmm. because they have 10 players on this roster. There it is. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's, I do think that's a recurring thing. It'll, we'll get there with Norway as well. You're going to have like one dominant team that has a lot of the players, I feel yep. like, for a lot of different teams mm-hmm. in this competition. Oh, I've got one final factoid, if you'll permit me a factoid. Um, Hwang Bo Ram um, is the only married woman on the squad mm-hmm. um, and will be the first mother to play for Korea at the World Cup. Uh, what's her name? Huang Bo Ram. All right. Yeah. I'm rooting for her now. Yeah. Like She's also it. a defender, so she may be the one to bring calm to the back line. <laughs> if she can bring like a maternal presence, everybody stop panicking. Maybe that could work out. She's the mother of the golden generation. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, shall I move us to Norway? Yes, please. All right. Norway, uh, nicknamed the grasshoppers, apparently. I'm going to change that to the locusts. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Why? Because... They kind of reappear every few years. Yeah. Uh, like 1991, they were the runners up in the Women's World Cup. 95, they were the Women's World Cup champions. 2000 Olympic champions. 2007, fourth place. 2009, Euro runners up. But it's a lot of like intermittent, and then in between, it's a lot of kind of downturn in form. Uh-huh. So sometimes they're hibernating and sleeping, <laughs> lying dormant. Sometimes they're uh, like all over the place. <coughs> they're apparently impervious to cold weather because locusts, I guess, can survive in cold weather. Obviously, Norway can do the same. But you the, know so much about locusts. I, I did some research. Uh, but the <laughs> the biggest reason is because they swarm in numbers and Norway are all about the high there pressure. We go. There you go. Love it. Yeah. Oh, uh, is this our first high pressing team? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah, I mean, I think France are more than capable of doing mm-hmm. it. I wouldn't say it's like necessarily a hallmark of what they're going to be doing, whereas Norway, I saw it routinely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, manager Martin Sjogren. I don't speak Swedish either. Another so one apologize. with a question mark on the end. Uh, yeah, well, he's a 42-year-old Swedish manager. Again, I don't t- speak Swedish, but he took charge in 2016 after winning the Swedish League. Um, he usually goes with a 4-4-2, sometimes a 4-2-3-1. Yeah, he's Swedish. But it's, yeah, <laughs> but it's, the, it's the kind of things that you would expect from a high-pressing team. It's aggressive press to win the ball high up the pitch. And then once possession is regained, there's kind of two methods they go for. Either runners into the box as quickly as possible to kind of capitalize on a mistake if you force the team into... I think they did this routinely against China uh, recently is the game that I saw where they would kind of force a goalkeeper into a mistake or force a defender into a mistake and then as soon as they get that ball back there are people hurtling forward locust swarm exactly Uh, and if that's not on or if the runs don't quite work then it's tight, very quick passing in and around the box with lots of movement to totally pull teams out of position and totally confuse teams. So it's like really quick passing, 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 and moving. And I think that's the way that you can sort of keep possession but pull teams out and then get some shots. So I don't didn't know much about Norway mm-hmm. before hearing from you. I am now excited to watch this team. You should be. I love a high-pressing team. I love a swarming team. There are reasons to be sad about this Norway team oh. uh, because th- I think they will be okay. I, d- I don't know how deep they will go in this tournament. I think they would certainly be way better if they had Ada Hegerberg, uh, 23-year-old yes. forward for Lyon, uh, current Ballon d'Or, uh, the first winner of the like f- uh, feminine Ballon d'Or, or however you pronounce that one, um, but is not playing for the team, has not played since the Euros in 2017. The and big question then is why? Sure. Um, it, it, it's a big question because it's kind of an unknown question. You'll see lots of ink 
not spilled anymore, I guess, but ink on your screen. Um, I guess that's not even – pixels on your screen, whatever. Pixels, uh, yeah. There's been much written about like why she's not playing. You'll see tons of articles about why this player isn't playing, why the current Ballon d'Or is – and really the answer is kind of unknown. Uh, her quote is, I've been quite critical direct with the Federation about what I felt hasn't been good enough in my career in the national team. That's about as specific as she's been. There's been other things. She said at one point that it wasn't necessarily about money because Norway – I think it was 2017. The men's team took a pay cut, so that now there's equal pay between the two yep. teams for like you know normal normal appearances and competitions and things like that. Did, didn't you tell me that the uh, Norwegian Federation or FA is spending more on the women's team this year than yes, on the men's team because of the World Cup year? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that doesn't include things like coach salary, where I think right. Lars Lagerbach is getting significantly more. Uh, but overall, yes, there's more equality there. But I think that's not necessarily the issue. The implication I got is that she either hasn't enjoyed what the federation has done since she was very young. Worth noting, she turned pro, I think, around her 15th birthday. Uh, so she's been professional for a very long time. Yeah. And I do think that maybe it's a product of like not enjoying either the Norwegian youth system or some of the issues with the Norwegian FA itself, or even maybe just the current coach and the current system they're playing that maybe she doesn't necessarily like the way they're playing. Maybe she doesn't want to be part of the high press. That's speculation. But it's, it's, it's a very, it seems like a nuanced situation with no clear answer. But it is a Big bummer. Uh, it because is, right? Ballon d'Or, not at the World Cup, even though her team is. It's sad. Here's one for you, though. It's sad, but it's also sad because you're missing out on a player who has made 146 appearances for Lyon in league and cup competitions. How many goals in 146 appearances? 90. 171. Ooh, what, more than? <laughs> yes. More goals than appearances is how many goals she scored for Lyon. That's the type of player we're talking about. But... And she's, I think, been top of the league when you combine goals and assists the last two seasons in a very competitive or somewhat competitive so, league. I guess not that competitive league, but a very strong league because Leon are very yeah, yeah. good. So does this mean Norway in trouble because they're missing Hegerberg? Or I, do they have like a, like a Hegerberg light or someone who could fill so, her boots? This, Is anyone fit okay. to fill her boots or at least shine her boots? I will give you my interpretation, yeah. my answer to that. I am certainly not an expert when it comes to the Norwegian uh, women's national team or of the two the people Hegerberg. in this room. You're the most qualified. Okay, well then I'll say this: <laughs> my if if you were to go with the read it, that maybe she didn't love the style of play, I think there's a lot more to it than that. Don't get me wrong, but if maybe part of it is informed by that she doesn't love the style then maybe that's a good thing for Norway because if maybe she doesn't want to be part of a high press, then she's not having to play in a high press, but there are other players who do want to kind of take part in that system. So a player like Isabel Herlofsson. Uh, she's a 30-year-old forward for uh, Kolbotten, I think is how you pronounce that one. K-O-L, lots of question marks. K-O-L-B-O-T-N. Come on, that one's hard. That's not uh, on it to me. It's her first club from when she, uh, I think, again, she, she's another one, turned pro at the age of 16. Uh, and it's her first club. She's back with them. She She's one of the players, I think you and I talked about this off air, there's a lot of this club, this club, this club, this club, moving around a lot. Yes, this is the thing. So this is, researching the Women's Mm. World Cup this deeply is kind of a new experience for us. And we start to notice like certain things that happen in women's soccer. Mm -hmm. And I think you and I both agreed, one of the things that happens is players move a lot more. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Than in the men's game. Yeah. I mean, we were like, we were surprised this summer when we had like, we had Danny Colaprico at our live show and then suddenly she was playing in the A-League and then she was back with Chicago. I think, Uh yeah, you, you go in search of where you can play and maybe where you can get a paycheck too. I think that's right. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And, and so for uh, Herlofsson is one of the more veteran players for this team, 125 appearances in all competitions for Norway, 57 goals. So can definitely score goals, but I would say she's similar in my mind to a player like Amy Rodriguez for the U.S. women's national team, at least she was in maybe 2015 thereabouts, yeah. where you're talking about like a fast, physical, nose for goal, but biggest of all is like high work rate. That you're like you're going to see her lead that press. She's going to be the one to really chase people down. She, like there's, it's a lot of the like almost like J- Jamie Vardy is the one who I think of as doing this, where it's like the ball goes from the like left back to the center back back to the goalkeeper, and she will just keep running and chasing that, <laughs> chasing that down until eventually she forces a stupid giveaway. But then the other thing that I really enjoy about uh, Isabel Herlofsson, again her name, uh, is that she can do that kind of work, but then when she gets the ball back. It's, it can be really difficult if you're playing in a high-pressure system to slow it down once you get the ball. And uh, I did see one recently where she she led the press. She forced a turnover from the goalkeeper. She then 
calmly chipped the goalkeeper instead of like kind of like, like you could forgive her for trying to drive forward and get like the shot off as fast as she could. But she yeah, kind yeah. of picks her heads up, takes a touch, sees where the goalkeeper is, evaluates it, then just kind of deftly chips the goalkeeper. And it's that sort of like high intensity pressure, but then calmness on the ball that you want from a striker who's That's leading the line in a high press right? system. Nope. So it Hulifson. is not. Hulifson yes. is the player to watch. She is. And then in terms of maybe their other key players, yeah. I would go with uh, Maren Mielde. As okay, a, yeah. Less you, of a question mark on that one. You, sh- you shared some highlights of Mielde. I with did. You, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. so I've seen a bit of Mielde. Uh, also tw- at Chelsea, right? She is. Uh, she's 29-year-old captain. Uh, I don't think she's the captain for Chelsea, but she is, I'm going to say, the Swiss Army knife of this team. I, I, can, can a Norwegian be Swiss? I'm not sure. Uh, but she's a Norwegian Army knife. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> she's, she's playing in her third World Cup. She started off as, I believe I'm correct in saying, a more attack-minded central midfielder, has slowly transitioned further and further back. She was a holding midfielder for them at the last World Cup. Uh, for Chelsea, she's a right back. For Norway, she will be the probably starting center back. Occasionally, they go to a back three. If that's the case, she will be the main center back in that back three. Okay. More often than not, they're in a 4-4-2. She'll be one of the two center backs. That says a lot about her importance then. It yeah. does, but it also tells you what she'll be doing as a center back because she is very, very good in possession under pressure. She does not lo- like get nervous because she's played central midfield. She's used to having the ball. She's used to having people kind of going at her at pace. So she can hold the ball. She can draw people in. She can beat them with a little bit of technical ability or she can just kind of play simple passes but she so doesn't panic. Can we see Maren Melda at centre back mm-hmm. like maybe going past people? Yes, I yeah, think absolutely. she'll take that risk. Because I she, love a centre back She has goes past no problem driving forward because she's got the pace to do so but she's got like again the good technical dribbling. It's mm-hmm. nothing particularly flashy but you'll just see her kind of Spot the space, take the space. Now, this is usually when she's playing as a right back for Chelsea, but I've seen her do it for Norway as well. I've also seen her about 25 yards from the opposition goal while playing for Norway, again as a center back. So she will also get in there, get some shots off. So I would expect to see her sort of conducting possession in the back and then kind of playing some probing balls here and there and maybe popping up to get a shot or two. Again, that's Maren Mielde. Maybe I'm just excitable, but like high pressing, lots mm-hmm. of short passing when they get the ball, a really fast striker who can suddenly slow it down, mm-hmm. a centre back who can dribble past people. Yep. I'm pumped to watch Norway now. I think you should be. Again, I, I really am sad that uh, that Hegerberg won't be there because yeah. I think that would make them all the more exciting, but she won't be. So I guess we have to make our peace with it. And it's worth noting, I mean, she's taking a stand. Like it, it does feel like she is protesting issues within the Norwegian FA and she's trying to kind of change things up and bring attention to equality. And that's definitely a good thing. But I would like to see her scoring goals. So I'm sad on that one. It's a good thing for Hulifson. That, that's definitely she true. She to be the star and striker. Right? <laughs> that's definitely true. Um, I, there, there, a few other things would you yeah, like yeah. to hear about? Uh, I told you about how they play. I'll go with Domestic League. The Norwegian yeah. uh, top city in. I'm sure it's Great like, name. I'm sure, but I'm sure with the Norwegian, like, uh, high pitched rhymingness, I'm sure it's like, top city in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because Nor- Norwegian is the best. Oh, it's maybe worth noting. Um, if you have any complaints about our pronunciations, uh-huh. uh, please send them to the email address. We're trying our hardest yeah. at totalsoccershow.com. Yes. We don't speak all languages at totalsoccershow.com. That's <laughs> mine. Um, the Nor- uh, Norwegian top city in was formed in 1984. Uh, it's 35 years old, so slightly older than me. That makes me happy. Uh, 12 teams, last team relegated, second to last team goes into a relegation playoff. Uh, and and as we've already kind of established as a trend, uh, current leaders in the, in the league, it's ongoing, uh, would be Lilström, which is an O with a line through it. Never mm-hmm. knew how to pronounce that one. Uh, known, I guess, better, sort of. Officially, they're known as LSK Kvinner Football Club. Uh, but yeah, we'll go with Lilström. Seven players on this roster, including uh, midfielder uh, Guro Reiten, top scorer in the league with 12 goals in 10 games. So she will probably, I think I have her as more of an impact sub, mm-hmm. uh, potentially coming off the bench. Uh, Emil Javi, oh no, excuse me, Emil Javi is your super sub for the national team. Uh, 15 goals in 76 appearances. And then uh, defender Ingrid Mo Wold is the club captain. So she's another veteran defender. So these are all players coming from playing in that one team, which is Lilström. Lilström. Mm-hmm. All right, and so that's f- Norway. Final one. Yeah, is a specific prediction for you. Oh, don't necessarily know if it's going to be true, uh, and I think Norwegian listeners, fans, journalists, whatever, may not love this one because uh, I, I think the Guardian preview had Caroline Graham Hansen as being like a key player, a potential breakout yeah, yeah, player. Yeah, winger, right? What I saw is that she misses penalties. <laughs> so I'm going to say uh, she's going to miss a penalty in this tournament. Yes, Ooh. I saw her m- miss. I think I saw her miss two, and then when I looked at her like stats for another game, she missed one 
playing for club for a club which is Barcelona. She's a 24 year old midfielder. She wears the number 10 for what, Norway. What's her name again? Uh, it is Caroline Graham Hansen. I think okay. she'll probably be the other striker uh, wearing number 10, but being kind of the second striker. But I think she – I saw her miss penalties, but then she keeps taking them for Norway, so she can definitely take them and score them. But maybe she misses one. I mean, A for effort. There you go. So that's my other <laughs> weirdly specific prediction that I will over-celebrate if it happens and completely forget about if it doesn't. <laughs> and so France and South Korea mm-hmm. opening against each other, then I assume it's Norway v. Nigeria. I um, believe you are correct. In 3 p.m. on June 8th. So the next day. Mm-hmm. Um, all right. We'll get to Nigeria in just a second. Okay. But first, today's show is sponsored by – for the penultimate, penultimate, excuse me, Ooh. time, Robin Hood. Again, that's a tough one to pronounce, so I, not, I, I don't fault you. Should, it should be easier. Robin Hood is an investing app that lets you buy and sell stocks, ETFs, options, and cryptos all commission-free. So yeah, other brokerages, which we, we will not name, brokerages that shall not be named, <laughs> charge up to $10 for every trade. Robin Hood doesn't charge any commission fees, so you, you can trade stocks and keep all your profits. I always forgot that Voldemort started that brokerage. It, yeah. was, it was controversial, yeah. and I never used it. How do you think he paid all those people that were supporting him? <laughs> Magic, <Yeah. laughs> which yeah. we previously established isn't real. Magic now it all makes sense. <laughs> now it all makes sense. He had a brokerage to do it, and then ma- Magic was the d- misdirect. I like it. Also, no nose. <laughs> also that. <laughs> you got to throw that one in there, too. Yeah. Uh, Robinhood has a simple, intuitive design, uh, making it easy, uh, making investing easy for newcomers and experts alike. I'm going to say I'm more in the newcomer category, uh, and so I very much appreciate that they make it that much easier for me to try to figure these things out. Newcomer is a new type of cucumber. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you were to invest... I feel like you're just reeling from not being able to say Robinhood. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> penultimate was the word I was trying to Oh, there it is. Yeah. Um, I, I messed up on the penultimate try. Okay. The penultimate. Um, if you were to buy stock in a player that we made... Saying it more doesn't make it, it right the first right. time. Um, but it increases my percentage. That's true. Uh, so if you were to buy stock in a play we've talked about so far at the Women's World Cup, uh-huh. whom would it be? Delphine Cascarino. There we 100%. go. 100%. <laughs> yes. is, is her stock like lowish now? No. Or is it just about to I mean, it, I think, I think uh, I've seen her written about plenty. I think many articles have pegged her as like a breakout player. Um, it, I, it Genuinely, I'm not trying to be like the hipster I knew about her when her first indie album came out. But like... <laughs> It really was that U.S. game. That, that was the first time that I was like, this is a problem. <laughs> like, she, is, <laughs> she is going to be an issue for the United States, and I don't necessarily know how they're going to deal with it. And yeah. I honestly, I, haven't, I don't know if I've talked about this very much, but I do think that that's why I've been, when we did our roster review show, why I was more upset about that left back spot and why there wasn't more depth there. Yeah, yeah. I do wonder if maybe like Delphine Cascarino was like, seeping into my brain and making me like, how are we going to defend this player? <laughs> we need somebody in there. And now I'm sad. So you did your research about mm-hmm. Delphine Cascarino. That's how yes. you managed to know so much about her game. People can research stocks via the Robin Hood app. They have all kinds of data. Um, it's really easy to just sort of go through that on your phone, take a look. And then with just four taps, mm-hmm. I bet it would take me more, but four taps is what Robin Hood say. Uh, you can place a trade, just four taps on your smartphone. And best of all, Robin Hood is giving listeners of Total Soccer Show a free stock like Apple, Ford, or Sprint to help you build your portfolio. Sign up at soccer.robinhood.com. That's soccer. That Robinhood.com. It sure is. Mm-hmm. And as I said, penultimate uh, time that Robinhood are advertising. I got it are again. you getting paid by that word? What's happening I here? mean, I'm getting paid for the ad, so okay. technically yes. All right. <laughs> they may knock some money off of my... Uh, I just feel like you, you, you took some bet somewhere that I don't know about where you had to say penultimate six times in one episode. <laughs> so Robinhood's coming towards the end of its run with Total Stock Show. So if you want to take advantage of this offer mm-hmm. and get a free stock, like literally if you've never owned a stock before, this is a way to do it for free. Mm-hmm. Um, Sucker.robinhood.com. Dot com. Use it by the end of the month to make sure that you can get it. All right. Thank you very much to Robin Hood for sponsoring today's episode. Meow. Uh, Daryl, shall we do some Nigeria previewing? And yes, yes. I said meow. Why because did you say meow? Uh, that, that's the game we're playing, meow. <laughs> we're going to see how many times we can say meow instead of penultimate. How about neither going forward of either? Clearly someone hasn't seen Super Troopers. I haven't. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. I haven't. <laughs> okay. Yes. Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Um, they are known as the Super Falcons, which okay. is, I think, my favorite nickname. It's pretty good. So far. It's strong. It's strong. They should be known as the Preppies. Ooh. All right. Because all the talk about I this Nigeria team. I like Super team, Falcons more, but sure. Yeah, I mean, me too. Um, all the talk about this Nigeria team so far is that this is the most prepared Nigerian women's national team <laughs> ever going into a World Cup. It's not because they wear like, pop collar shirts. <laughs> I mean, I assumed it wasn't. Stuff. Although I was wondering for a moment, like, do they have like extra sweet collared jerseys? Is that what we're doing? <laughs> I know Nigeria has some sweet jerseys. <laughs> so yeah, the prep is because they're going to be well prepared. So here's the story with the Nigerian mm-hmm. uh, women's national team. They've made every World Cup. 
since 1991 because they're the best really? team in Africa. I did not know right? that. And they dominate at the African Women's Cup of Nations. Uh-huh. Um, they haven't won it every time, but like most of the times. Um, but the result of that is that when they qualify for the World Cup, Nigerian Football Federation are like, all right, you, you keep winning all the time. Like, we're not going to make any special effort. Uh. We don't plan a bunch of friendlies. We mm-hmm. don't really do good prep. Just go. You'll be fine. You're good, right? And then they don't do that well like they've only got at the group stage once i believe did i read did i am i correct in saying that i read that they like hadn't played any games until like april of 2018 or something like that after qualifying i feel like they had like a a long gap where they weren't playing competitive games or any games rather yes but they've kind of i'm sure they're still not perfect in the Mm -hmm. football federation in terms of how they treat the uh the super falcons but this time they are more prepared um one of the things they did is they signed up for the cyprus cup Mm -hmm. which um i I never realized the thing i've learned about women's soccer is you know the she believes cup yeah there were all kinds of similar events of like uh, not giant like World Cup style tournaments, but oh, smallish yeah. tournaments that, makes sense. that happen so that teams can go and get some tournament ex- like competitive experience. Nigeria normally don't do that. This time they went to the Cyprus Cup. Is it is it played in Cyprus? I'm going to say yes, I would but I'm not 100 percent so. sure. I'm going to assume <laughs> yeah. uh, Cyprus, Cyprus, not Turkish Cyprus. So I know that sounds like a small guess. thing, but for this Nigeria team, it's a big thing, mm-hmm. right? And then they've also hired an experienced Swedish coach. There were two Swedish coaches in Group A, despite the absence of the Swedish national team. Um, Thomas Denneby is yeah. the Swedish mm-hmm. coach, Nigerian national team. Um, he was the actual Sweden coach between 2005 and 2012, finished third at the 2011 World Cup. Mm-hmm. So the Nigerian Federation have gone out and hired, essentially they've gone and who's the, who's the best and most experienced coach we can mm-hmm. get? Thomas Denneby um, was the guy. In a very Swedish style, He's been preaching structure. Okay. He's all about structure. This team, I think he's going to play a sort of 4-2-3-1, two, two defensive midfielders, um, and the goal will be to use the wealth of attacking talent that Nigeria have mm-hmm. and play balls in behind for the forward, Ashwala, and the two wide attackers to run onto. Okay. That's the whole game plan. Stay structured. Don't get stretched out, but get those balls in behind for especially Ashwala. We'll get to her in a bit to run onto. The big question then becomes, like, uh, in the Guardian preview that I read of, of Nigeria, I think they kept saying, like, Denerby has tried to implement the system and has tried to get the players kind mm-hmm. of playing what he wants them to be doing. Like, the implication there was, like, maybe the writer wasn't sure they were doing that. Do you yeah. feel like the style has been embraced? Do you feel like it is something where they kind of are genuinely more prepared and are kind of better attuned to play that style of soccer? I don't know about the defending. Okay. I, I really don't know if that four two three one structure like holds as perfectly um, as Denneby would like it to. Mm-hmm. I just haven't seen enough. Yeah. I do know that the idea of getting balls in behind for a Shwala to run onto, yeah. everybody's in on that. Okay. <laughs> Thumb, <laughs> thumbs up all around uh, for that approach. Um, we'll get to Aziza to Ashwala, like mm-hmm. in detail maybe in a second because she's kind of the... Uh, the face of this team in many ways. Right? Mm-hmm. She's the star player. Super Z um, is what they call her. But before I move on to her, I just want to mention a couple of the players that will be important. Uh, number 17, Franny Ordega. Uh, Washington Spirit uh, fans might remember her. She will be... I think she'd like to play centre forward, but Ashwala's there. So she'll be like wide right or wide left forward. And she'll be uh, coming in from the wings as well. So keep an eye on Ordega, number 17. And the player tasked with slipping those balls in for the most part is... And Gozi Akobi, mm-hmm. number 13, but she'll be the kind of number 10 tacky midfielder. That will be the player looking to play those passes in behind. And Gozi um, Akobe? And Gozi Akobe, yeah. Um, and then in terms of defensive midfielders, the, the one player that I definitely know will start is number 10, Rita Chikwele, number 10. You'll see her as the sort of defensive midfielder. And I say you'll see her because she has bleach blonde hair. So she'll, she'll kind of stand out. She always stands out when I watch her. Right. Um, not, not that I watch her all the time, but, you know, I've been researching. I'm, I'm watching I'm, some footage. Here's where my brain is. Yeah. Uh, Usually, oh, yeah, we're an hour in. This is about yeah, when my yeah. brain starts to get weird. Uh, <laughs> I can only think of two other Ritas, one of whom is Rita Skeeta, who's not a is good Rita person. Skeeta? Yeah, I think from Harry Potter. And then I think Rita is the bad, is the evil character in the first season of Power Rangers. Okay. So I'm excited for there to be a good Rita yeah. that how we about, can all get behind. How about lovely Rita Meter Maid? Yeah, is she real? I don't know. I don't, and also, no, she's I a meter think, maid. I can't I believe Paul McCartney made her. I can't believe that's a good thing. <laughs> so anyway, um, two defensive midfielders. Um, I and thought then, all of Paul McCartney's songs were just about how John Lennon's a bad father. No, <laughs> some of them are. Okay. <laughs> and then balls in behind for Ashwala. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk key players? Yes, please. Guess who the key player is? Uh, is it one of the ones I've already said? It's Ashwala. Okay. <laughs> Azizat mm-hmm. Ashwala is um, Super Z, they call her. I like Super she'll, Z. She'll be wearing number eight. She is the striker. She is like the Alex Morgan of this team. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like the face of the team and the one everyone's hyped for, Super Z. And and can I add there, Super Z, like you might think it's like S-U-P-E-R and then the letter Z. It's all one word. It's Super and then Z-E-E. Is, right? I like that. I like, I like that. that. Well. It's like it's, it, That feels like a proper nickname. Yep. It's like, ah, we, Super Z. We'll just add a letter in there. Why not? Yeah. <laughs> and here's why it really works sort mm-hmm. of to 
just have this idea of like let's slip balls in behind for Ashwala to run onto. She is. We watched some footage together of this, right? Because she, she plays for Barcelona right now. Um, she is very good at one timing the run, which I feel like is key. When you're fast, you mm-hmm. can be fast and you can be offside a lot. Yep. Not great. If you can time it perfectly and you can bend it and you can get on the defender's blind side, then you're in behind and you're onside and the defender's surprised. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and and but also I feel like from from the little I saw of her from Super Z, uh, I also really enjoyed that. Like, now it was a, it was for Barcelona when they were four 0 down to Lyon in the yes, Champions League final, final right, yeah. but it was still like it was her happily going for it and like shooting when she got the opportunity. Yeah, and I do feel like that's a sort of like we got to get something going, we got to make something happen. It's, we're kind of resting on you now. We've brought you in, make something happen. Yeah, and I feel like that's a thing that may be happening for Nigeria in this tournament. Uh, given so the strength of, of this group, yes, yes. Yeah, so I think giving her the freedom to sort of like make those runs in, shoot when you can, see what happens. I yeah. feel like that suits her game. And I've seen some great finishes mm-hmm. from her. I've seen her like roulette a keeper and then back heel it in. That'll work. I've seen her go one on one with the keeper, send the keeper down and go in the corner. But I've also seen some shots that go wide. I think I saw one that went out for a throw in. Yeah. So it's not like she's, I, I would say her her running in behind is maybe better than her finishing. Mm-hmm. But it's better to be in the spot to have the chances and maybe you make, you know, you're on target 50% of the time. Yeah. Uh, than to not be able to get in behind at all. That makes sense. You know? it also, it's also, she's she's been there before, is the other one. Like, as I said earlier, she played in the last World Cup, I yep. think. Is this her? No, it's it's uh, the other player we're going to talk about who's been there many, many, many mm-hmm. times. But yeah, uh, so you have that kind of like, the veteran presence has been in a World Cup before, but also is kind of going to be given free range to score and make those runs. Yeah. That feels like a good combination of things. And I want to give you just an impression of how famous Aziza Tashwala is. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a Nigerian Uber driver here in Richmond uh, a couple of weeks ago. Really? Um, I'm hoping maybe they listen to the show because I told them about the Tottenham Soccer Show. We got chatting soccer and he started like listing his favorite players. And it was, you know, not predictable, but the guys you would expect, JJ Okacha, Noan Kukanu. Aziza Tashwala okay. was on his list. That's how famous Tashwala is for Nigerian soccer fans. And I would add that the reason why I said really when you said you had a Nigerian Uber driver is not because that was surprising to me. It's because for a moment, I thought, you said this was weeks ago? Yeah, it was I, when Hugh and Pete were here. I thought you'd already started your Nigeria research that long ago <laughs> that you like asked questions about her. And I was like, wow, Daryl is on top of things, whereas me at 1 a.m. last night was less so. Okay, but now I feel better. Now I feel better. That's good. That's good. So I've definitely said her name enough, right? Aziza mm-hmm. Ashwala, number eight. Super Z. She's the, Super Z is the striker to watch mm-hmm. for Nigeria. The defender to watch is Anomi Ebi. Yeah. 36 years old. She'll wear number five. For Ebi, this will be her fifth. World mm-hmm. Cup. That's a record for an African player, um, is what I read. Yep. Luckily, there were some defensive highlight videos sure of Ebby for me to go watch. You know I love a defensive highlight video. She seems to me like the epitome of a veteran defender. Yep. Right? Mm-hmm. So she's not relying on pace. She's not sort of like super aggressive to go and win the ball. Everything seems like the correct decision. Mm-hmm. She steps when she can win it. When she doesn't, she'll like let the player receive the ball, but then she'll close off all the options with yep. like good angles, um, good body shape. Seems really calm on the ball. Like not like she doesn't hack it clearances wide, but she'll have like the one touch pass out to the left back kind mm-hmm. of uh, can, kind can of defender. Can I take a shot for a Please second? Please do. Yeah, you, think, you watched this video as well, right? I did, and uh, it's a player that we t- that uh, I talked about with Grant Wall last week. She reminds me of Vincent Company. She reminds yes. me of that. Like, like I was going to say the same. She, she wins. I mean, admittedly, it was a highlight reel, so of course she's yeah. going to win everything in that highlight reel. But I saw her win everything in the air. Yeah. But yeah, to your point, but not it was, with giant jumps. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It wasn't this sort of like comes flying in. Wins. She can do that. She could definitely be physical if the situation requires it. But it was a lot of smart positioning, smart usage of her body to kind of like lever off a person to then win the header. But then mm-hmm. also, yeah, as you said, can also be calm and kind of slow, slow player down, make a big defensive play if need be. All of that felt very familiar to uh, what Grant Wall wrote about Vincent Company. Yeah, and I also saw a lot of. Someone who was faster than her, Mm -hmm. for sure, but she managed to take the angle between the ball and the player. Then you have to be extra fast because then you've got to go around her, and she makes that hard by Mm -hmm. adjusting her position. So essentially, this is a very savvy, calm centre-back, Anomi Ebi, 36 years old, number five for the Super Falcons, or the preppers, mm-hmm. um, as I She prefer. did play six fewer minutes last World Cup than Super Z, so <laughs> she was slacking a little bit, and I'd like her to get it together. I've got a better, I've got a better uh, uh, piece of trivia for What'd you. What you got? In the African Women's Cup of Nations mm-hmm. final in 2016, Anomi Ebi fractured her arm and kept playing to the final whistle 
and I was going to say lifted the trophy. Maybe she didn't actually lift the trophy because of the fractured arm, but won the trophy. I mean, she does what she wants. Yeah. I feel like she might have lifted it. So Nomi Ebi would definitely be one, a player to watch because like, it's good to see a veteran classy mm-hmm. defender perform, but also important because like Nigeria are not the strongest team in this group. They're really up against it. Um, her performance will be really, really important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. So uh, any other uh, points on Nigeria? Yes. Okay. You ready for this? Uh-huh. There are some wild cards okay. for Nigeria. And by that, I mean players who I haven't seen a lot of. I've just seen a little bit mm-hmm. of. And they're young. So I don't know if any of these players will start or if we'll see them at all. But when they enter a game, I'll be excited. So I've got a trio of young wild cards I just want to highlight for people. Let's have it. Right? So buckle up, Taylor. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number 15, Rashidat Ajibade. 19 years old. Her shaved head says, I'm all business. Her status as Nigeria's freestyle soccer champion Uh-oh. says, look at these flicks and tricks. Okay. Yes. All right. So number 15, um, Ajibade, 19 years old. She's the freestyle champion. She has all kinds of wild skills. Not necessarily a starter. You but say, is that good, though, if you're trying to play like a system? It's fascinating. Okay. It's fascinating, right? Because I'm really interested in that idea of, um, have you ever seen like freestyle soccer players who are obviously just insanely talented? Mm-hmm. They do crazy things with the ball, but you hear that they like... They were in a youth team somewhere and then they never made it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because it is. It, soccer's about game sense, right? And all that kind of stuff that maybe freestyle soccer players mm-hmm. don't have. So I'm basically, that's why it's, that's why she's a wild card. I'm interested. Does Ajibade mm-hmm. have that game sense and can she bring those flicks and tricks to to bear in an effective way? So that would be a thing I'll be keeping That feels a little bit like if we see her playing, then it's like Nigeria flying through the air right now. Yeah. And so we got to put somebody down to try to make maybe, something happen. Maybe. Like, like a young Tommy Thompson. Yeah. Um, okay. Exactly like a young Tommy Thompson. <laughs> All right. So I told you to buckle up. Get uh-huh. ready for this. Number 12, 21 years old, Uchenna Kanu. Mm-hmm. Great name to have for a Nigerian footballer. Mm-hmm. Um, Uchenna Kanu plays for Southeastern University, which is in Florida. Not NCAA, NAIA. Okay. NAIA. So mm-hmm. I'm assuming lower standard, right? Uh, no, uh, yes and no, in the sense that I believe NAIA is the one where you, if you have previously been a professional, but you still want to play college soccer, then you can do that. Okay. And I think that's what NAIA exists for. Uh, we, My college was destroyed by an NAIA team. Oh, interesting. So, yeah, they were pretty good. Okay, well, Lin- playing... I think Lindsey Wilson have won multiple national titles, and that was who it was, but... I'm sure this one this one is pretty good too. Playing in the NAIA mm-hmm. for Southeastern University, Uchenna Kanu has played 55 times oh boy. across three seasons. Mm-hmm. I would like you to guess how many goals. Is this an uh, Ada Hegerberg sort of situation here? Yes. 55, you said? Yeah, 55 appearances across three seasons. Uh, I'm going to say like 78 goals. 150 there goals we go. in 55 appearances. Shh. That's just a little bit better than two goals per game. A little bit. And just to add in, 33 assists. Okay, okay. So she has absolutely destroyed it in the NAIA. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of footage. I obviously saw footage of her scoring goals. It looked, she looked lethal. It was I a mean, lot of, yeah. It was a lot of like stuff from angles, but she would find the bottom corner. Um, I don't know how that translates to the Women's World Cup from the NAIA. So again, wild card. But when she comes on the field, I'll be paying attention. I do trust an NAIA stat keeping, but that does feel like the type of stat that anywhere else you'd be like, it feels made up. I thought <laughs> that it feels was like on... Pele's thousand goals. Do you or remember, we were talking about another player uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I got it backwards. The games and goals I got backwards. Or that could be. But you yeah. were just like, oh yeah, I know what you did there. Yeah. I really thought that's what happened here. <laughs> Fifty-five appearances, one hundred and fifteen goals. Her name one more time. Uchenna Kanu. Okay. Number 12. Um, the it's an final, easy one to remember. Final player, I couldn't find any footage no, of. No relation though, right? I don't think I so. really wanted that to be the case, but it okay. It would be great, right? Yeah. Um, so final player, Anam Imo, number seven, 18 years old, wide attacker. I think has the sort of best possibility of starting based on I've seen her name listed in some lineups, but I couldn't find footage of those games. Um, so I have nothing to say about her game because I haven't seen it. I just think... She's one of these, the trio of wild cards. Anam Emo, number seven, 18 years old, one of the wide attackers. Is it just, just because of her age that you're putting in the wild card category then? Because of her age and the fact that she's managed to actually start for the Nigerian okay. national team at 18 years old. There's got to be something there. I just don't know what it is. That's why she's a wild card. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Hopefully that's not what uh, Coach Denerby says in the like final yeah. press conference before the game. But I, like the idea I know there's something there. I like the idea of him having this 4-2-3-1 yeah. structure. And then, obviously, Ashwala is mm-hmm. the striker you can rely on. Uh, maybe Akogi is the, the player he can rely on the three balls. But then just a bunch of wild cards around just to throw things in and see what happens. I mean, I, I'm a little annoyed that you haven't made any sort of Always Sunny Charlie Kelly references while saying wild, wild card repeatedly, but so be it. I mean, so be it. isn't it a sunny reference every time I say it? Pretty much. I guess so. I guess so. <laughs> uh, final just quick note on domestic Nigerian soccer. Mm-hmm. Um, the Nigeria Women's Premier League was founded in 1990. 
It has 16 teams and there's also a second division. Okay. So Nigerian uh, domestic women's soccer, um, been around a while, seems like reasonably stable. But the best players end up leaving for Sweden, mm-hmm. Norway, or increasingly, I find in my research, China. China. I'm confused How did about you know that. that? Uh, because I found the same thing. And also reading about uh, Super Z and Ebi, I saw yeah. the same thing. Oh, yeah, because Super Z, she plays for Barcelona, but she's on loan from a Chinese team. Yeah, yeah. and I think Herlofsen as well went to China briefly and then came back. It, it feels, I don't know anything about this. My. Like, guess if I had to make one would be that it's a similar situation to the men's game where it's they're sort throwing of money at they're throwing players. money at players yeah. to try to get more experienced internationals over there. Sometimes it works, sometimes it does not. I mean, and I think maybe for, for female soccer players, mm-hmm. go get that money, right? Yep. As Beyonce says, best revenge is your paper. <laughs> well done, sir. Well done. <laughs> Anything you want to add on Group A? Yeah, uh, two things I should have mentioned. One, uh, France has the best jerseys. Uh, the white polka dot. Oh, you I'm, show me all, these. I'm all about that white yes. polka dot jersey. Uh, and two, they're the home team, but that doesn't mm-hmm. really matter, right? They'll they'll have them play in the away jersey at some point. At some point, yeah. yeah. But also, they've got the blue. You mm-hmm. gotta have the blue. Uh, and then the other one I should have mentioned when I was talking about Herlovson, uh, as like an example of what I was talking about about her leading the press, but also scoring goals. When I did like the uh, the Y Scout. Uh, like automatic video report, most of the clips were either uh, goal, like her scoring goals, or it was all, or it was titled aggressiveness. It was a lot of like goal, aggressiveness, aggressiveness, goal, aggressiveness, goal, goal. Like it was, it was a lot of that. It was a lot of aggressive running and then goal scoring. Well, that fits with the Norwegian style of play. There we go. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh huh. So those are my two uh, follow up final points. All That's right. it from me. And once again, Women's World Cup kicks off June seventh. Mm-hmm. This has been our Group A preview. There are six groups all in all. Our Group B preview will be later this week. <laughs> ah, non-committal answers. Yes, yes. Sometimes. Show me the lie. All right. Yeah, it'll be yeah, in there. It'll, it'll be in there. Be but... later this week. Because also this mm-hmm. week we've got the Europa League final this on Wednesday. Chelsea Arsenal in Baku. Mm-hmm. The less said about that, the better. We're going to rant about that a little uh, bit tomorrow. We probably will, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Champions League final is on Saturday, so we'll probably have a, a preview of Liverpool Spurs as well. Probably less the, ranting about that one. In the Champions League final. It's an interesting game. Mm-hmm. right? So, yeah. So, that's what's coming up this week. The two European finals and women's Well, World and all previews. the players can travel there. So, that's the other thing. <laughs> <laughs> we may also get some sort of Gold Cup roster, I'm mm-hmm. guessing, early next week. You know, the US men are um, just practicing somewhere in Maryland with the U23s in that weird blended roster that you and Travis talked about? Yes. I think that camp scheduled to end June 2nd. So, yeah, maybe like June 2nd, June 3rd, June 4th would be my guess is when we get like the Gold Cup roster. Okay, so roster. early next week. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. good we have a lot to talk about this yes. week. Yes. Anyway. Uh, although, when, whatever we have like hard and firm plans for, that's when they're going to announce the roster. That's my <laughs> guess. If you've enjoyed our Women's World Cup Group mm-hmm. A preview, please let people know. There yep. is not that much information out there in terms of World Cup 2019 Mm-mm. previews. So we would love for you to share this with people so people know they can find this information, especially if you enjoyed the show. If you didn't enjoy it, then why are you still listening? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, I guess like the Howard Stern thing. Have you listen longer because you're angrier, maybe? <laughs> Hopefully we haven't gone that route. Uh, but what route we will go is yeah. to the Scouting Network, if that yes, works for you. Uh, we've got some scouting reports to get to. A few of these combined because, uh, not trying to throw you under the bus, but Daryl's on vacation while Daryl was gone. We didn't do a lot of scouting updates. Yeah. Uh, so we've got a few that have kind of been condensed. Do you mind if I briefly explain the scouting network? Because I'm aware that maybe some people will listen to this show, like maybe as their first Total Sock mm-hmm. show, they won't know what we're talking about. I so suppose. So the Total Sock Show Scouting Network is one of the ways that uh, the show exists. Mm-hmm. Um, we ask people to this sign up out. at totalsockshow.com slash join, and you contribute between 5 and $25 a month, completely your choice. And then you are added to the Total Sock Show Scouting Network, which means you are a scout. We assign you a young player to keep track of. And this is the segment of the show where we keep track of all the talented up-and-coming youngsters. Mm-hmm. we got some Americans in here. We've got some big-name players in here, starting with Drew, uh, a.k.a. Dreek von Truins, Drew Trammell, uh, scouting Martin Odegaard, 20-year-old Norwegian attacker for Real Madrid. Super I- famous. Right, Martin Odegaard. This is a guy that everybody knew about. A I mean, Odegaard's kind of famous. Dreek yeah. van Truins, though. That's that's <laughs> the truth. Uh, Odegaard scored two goals in the penultimate. And there it is again. <laughs> there it is again. I didn't know that was coming. All right. I feel like you did. Yeah. Uh, two goals in the penultimate yeah. Eredivisie game in their 6-1 win over Loli de Grafschap. Uh, Vitesse qualified for the Europa League playoff against Groningen. They lost the first leg but came storming back to win 4-3 on aggregate. In the second leg, Odegaard scored the opener in the second minute, Woo. took out seven players with one pass to assist for the second goal, and then beat three defenders to earn and take a corner that resulted in a near-post header for the decisive goal. So Martin Odegaard doing pretty well. Yeah, I think all of that was in like the first 31 minutes, too. Wow. So not bad. Uh, New Numerous media reports are linking Ajax with a $20 million uh, transfer purchase with a 2021 buyback clause for Real Madrid as the Dutch champions look to reinforce uh, ahead of key departures this summer. I've also seen it rumored that he will be loaned out for maybe like a two-year loan to get him more experience, even though I feel like he's played a lot for a 20-year-old. 
I could see him at Ajax. Mm-hmm. It would just be the 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 weirdly obvious fit, right? Yeah, I think so. Especially as they have a bit of a turnover mm-hmm. year. So Odegaard to Ajax is the rumor to keep an eye on this summer. Maybe. I would like. I mean, even if not a sale, then a loan. I feel like that would make a lot of yeah. sense. Uh, I would rather a sale because then Madrid don't get him back. But I guess if they have the buyback clause, <laughs> they get him back anyway. Next up, Guy Edwab is scouting Serge Gnabry, the 23-year-old German wide forward for Bayern Munich. Guy says Bayern's down-to-the-wire title win means that Gnabry has his first club title, um, has won a starting spot for a Champions League team and possibly his national team. Um, He was second to Lewandowski in attacking production, 10 goals and 5 assists. I'm going to guess that's a distant second. Um, <laughs> while playing only half of available minutes this season. And with the end of robbery, he will <laughs> robbery. I love that he line. will almost certainly play more next season. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to add, unless Bayern managed to sign Leroy Sané. Unless. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think we're going to have a very busy summer, not just because yeah. of all the tournaments. With managers leaving and being signed and then leaving again somehow, uh, and lots of players on the move, we're going to stay busy, Mr. Grove. Oh, do we have to read the next game report? Yes, we do. It's kind of bad news in some ways, right? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, ben Richards scouting Efren Alvarez, the 17-year-old Mexican midfielder for the LA Galaxy. Mexican-American. Once they've decla- I thought about this. Once they're playing for a national team, yeah, they're that's... that until they're not playing for that national okay. team. If they're, if they're still really eligible, then I will give them both. But he's going to play for Mexico. Okay. Let's be real. Um, Efren joined the Mexican U-17 team as they ran the table at the U-17 <laughs> CONCACAF Championship over the last two weeks, or a few weeks. He contributed with three goals and two assists, the last of which was an impressive chip over the U.S. back line onto the head of Santiago Munoz. Seen it. Not Munez, because for a minute I was like, what is this goal? What's happening here? <laughs> uh, uh, for the equalizing goal and an eventual victory over the Stars and Stripes in the final, at club level, he has not seen any of the pitch after appearing in the first two matches of the season. It's actually been kind of weird, right? Yes. He's got like a strong start under Scalato and mm-hmm. then seems to have fallen out of favor. Yep. And I want to say I've seen some stuff about maybe like he hasn't been applying himself as mm. Scalato would have liked. I don't know that for a fact. I think I've just read some weird rumors. I mean, they, that could be. Or maybe I'm starting rumors because he's I feel like you're starting rumors because he chose Mexico, yeah. I take that back I, then. I think like that's maybe what happened. I have no basis for that. <laughs> Dylan Viach is scouting Kai Havertz, uh-huh. the 19-year-old German midfielder for Bayer Leverkusen. Mm-hmm. Kai Havertz in the news a lot. I think I linked him with the transfer somewhere. Um, Kai Havertz. Kai scored the opener in Leverkusen's 5-1 Champions League earning victory over Hertha Berlin this weekend. Mm-hmm. I'm going to guess Champions League spot earning. Yes. You can't win the Champions League with a Bundesliga game, right? Uh, no, you cannot. <laughs> so Kai scored the opener. Otherwise, Bayern no. definitely would have done it. <laughs> yeah, 5-1 win over Hertha Berlin. His 17th goal of the season for a 19-year-old um, was a lovely half volley that he allowed to drop over his shoulder before blasting past the keeper. This will make for an interesting summer for the youthful Leverkusen squad. And Dylan, an Arsenal fan, is hoping that Daniel Levy does not listen to TSS and that Daryl's Havertz prediction, the aforementioned, mm-hmm. does not come to fruition. I still, this is the second thing that you've now kind of prematurely referenced. I feel like you read these scouting reports. That's why Penultimate found its way in. That's I, why. Honestly, spr- not. Yeah, uh-huh. sure, 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 sure. We'll see what happens there. Russell Varner, scouting Alex Mendez, 18 year old American midfielder for SC Freiburg. Yes. Yes. Mendez was arguably the best attacking threat uh, the U20 Americans had in their 2 to 1 loss to Ukraine, but even still, he struggled to get into the flow of the game and never got to play the creative role role that the United States needed. He did crack some shots with his left foot from distance. Though. That he did. Much like the rest of his teammates, he looked much more comfortable in their 2-0 win over Nigeria on Monday, showing off his creativity and his ability to move defenders with his eyes and body language. That's uh, not inaccurate. That's exactly not. what he was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah, And worth noting, Russell did send us a video that links to uh, basically him doing just that. Is so it that pass to Tim Weyer in the 21st minute? I believe it was. Yeah. Uh, he subbed out following a possible head injury, but tweeted Tuesday morning that he is feeling fine. That is good news. Yes. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I was a little worrying. Yes, um, it certainly was. Especially Matt, since that's the one where the referee just was like, nah, just keep playing. It's fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Including when the ball went out of bounds and it still was like, nah, no, 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 it's cool. Not he- head injuries are totally fine. I imagine that wasn't Taylor Thomas' favorite moment of that game. I would guess not. Mm-hmm. Matt Koss is scouting Lucas Toussaint, the 22 year old French midfielder for Lyon. Uh, Lyon successfully qualified for the Champions League, six points clear of Saint Etienne and 11 points ahead of Marseille. Mm-hmm. Toussaint made 30 appearances this season, but was mostly a substitute near the end of the campaign. He and Efren Alvarez can hang out. <laughs> uh, Anurag Anjaria scouting uh, Andrea Novakovic, 22 year old American striker on loan at Fortuna Sittard from Reading, although that loan has now completed. It's pronounced reading. Oh, excuse me. I apologize. <laughs> and also not. don't like you. Uh, <laughs> Novakovic got a nice send-off from Fortuna Siddard as he finished his lone spell, a stop score in all competitions with 11 goals, and was a key player in their relegation battle, which they won. They mm-hmm. are still in the top flight. He now faces a pivotal summer back at Reading. Uh, he has a year <laughs> remaining. Reading, for people who have never listened to the show before, we know it's Reading. Uh, Daryl at TotalSoccerShow.com if you want to criticize his pronunciation. Uh, no, it's, we're trying our hardest at TotalSoccerShow.com. Excuse me. Uh, Novakovic has a year remaining on his contract, but has 
been out on loan for the last two seasons, so it's time for him to either fight for his place in Reading's first team or look for a new club. Ben Tondera is scouting Mason Holgate, the 22-year-old English defender on loan at West Brom from Everton. Mm-hmm. West Brom season ended when they were knocked out of the EFL playoffs by Villa, I believe. Um, Holgate is headed back to Everton after playing primarily right back for West Brom in 21 EFL Championship appearances since January, where he got one goal and four assists. That's basically all the games, right? Mm-hmm. From January, yep. especially. Um, Everton have no plans to sell Holgate at this time, so we'll need to see if he can earn a spot in the 19 to 20 squad. Oh, the 2019 2020 squad. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> My guess is he goes out on loan again. Uh, yeah, that, that sounds yeah. about right. Maybe maybe sold? I don't know, because the other point that Ben was making is that Everton maybe are going to try to like get some money off the books, get some players off the roster so they can like trim it down, but then sign the players they need to reinforce. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't know if Mason Holgate will be a trimming type player or a keeping because probably on a lower salary type player. Got it. Um, all right. So thank you to everybody mm-hmm. for the scouting report. If yep. you'd like to join the network, it's totalsoccershow.com slash join. That's a way to support the show. Mm-hmm. If you've already done so and you haven't got your player, please email me, Daryl, the actual email address, Daryl, D-A-R-Y-L, at totalsoccershow.com. Let me know you haven't received your player and I will get them to you as soon as possible. Especially um, if you've heard of uh, some up-and-coming uh, women's players, mm-hmm. uh, female players for the Women's World Cup uh, that you'd like to scout, I think this would be a good time to add them to the network because we're learning about new players as we research these teams. We right? certainly are. Yeah. All right, yeah. There we go. There in, we go. We're in agreement. All right, so there's our show, Women's World Cup Group A preview in the books. One down, five more to go. Oh, boy. Yeah. It's going to be a couple of late nights, I think. It is, but we're learning loads. I'm, I feel like I'm learning more primed for the World Cup, mm-hmm. the Women's World Cup, than ever because yep. I'm going to know more than ever. Yes. Like, I'll know more about it just the, than just the US team. That's, that's an <laughs> exciting development for both of us. <laughs> so, Taylor Rockwell, I will say thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me today. Scotland's going to beat England. Oh, how dare you. <laughs> Listeners, thank you for listening, and we will talk to you again soon. 